Welcome back, America. The music name, David M. Drucker, the Washington Examiner, is in the house. Uh, Merry Christmas to you, David. Happy New Year. I am curious, uh, George Santos, whose resume was not investigated because New York City only has 5,000 newspapers that might have done so. Um, are you following that story very much? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm getting ready for the next uh, HBO uh, miniseries. <laughs> but, you know, it's I mean, such a remarkable... No one... No, what did no one on the opposite team do any oppo research on George Santos at all? It it's got to be one of the biggest colossal failures of op research that I I've seen in recent memory. You know, it, you know, op research usually it, it gets derided as you know you're trying to dig up dirt that's not really dirt and package information as dirt and then get some you know unsuspecting reporter to write it up, but. Like, op research done right is about digging up actual documents. It's not sexy at all. You send people out to courthouses and, you know, just dig through paper. And you find out what's true and what's not about somebody. And none of that appears to have been done here. Maybe it was and it was just done badly. But this is, you know, this is an issue ultimately not so much, I think, because he lied, apparently lied about, whether he was Jewish or Catholic and, and where Oh, he and, lied. He lied a lot. And, but, you know, yeah. but, David, but, does it even where matter? Where did his money come from? That's going to be the issue to you. Where did his money come from? Well, I'm pretty sure it's Sam Bankman Freed. I, I, that's where all the money <laughs> came from. So, you know, compared to Sam Bankman Freed, this guy's a piker. Look, George Santos is a Republican. He got elected in Long Island. If you haven't been following the story because you've been stuck in traffic in Ohio or New Jersey or, or, or anywhere, and you're in an airport somewhere, George Santos uh, inflated his resume to the size of a Goodyear blimp. It's not criminal. It's really stupid. And it will certainly mean his reelection will be an interesting one. He has uh, about a year and a half to prove to people he's not a moron. But he's not going to resign, David Drucker, because the Republicans need his vote. No, he's not going to resign. He's going to be seated. And lying about who you are and your background is usually politically unwise, but you can work through that. I do think as investigations into him continue, the issue, and this is why I brought it up, of where his money came from and how he obtained it, if there is any criminality in that, that's where his seat becomes uh, threatened, where he may not be able to hang on in the House. Although these days, you know, politicians seem to survive a lot without... Uh, oh, and we're not going to be talking about him in a week. I just wanted to bring it up because it's really <laughs> more an indictment of the local newspapers than anything else. What do you hear about uh, Speaker McCarthy? Speaker designate McCarthy, McCarthy's uh, travails, are they over? No. He's still trying to dig up the votes to uh, win the gavel. And I don't know how to predict how things are going to go next week. We are now, what, a week away? He yeah. doesn't have the votes yet. One of the members of the Gang of Five, Republicans. the Matt Gates-led uh, Gang of Five, has turned on Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, which is truly symb a symbol of American politics that the far right edge of the Republican caucus is now caught in a civil war. Right, the ten people on the far right side. It's like well, Ilhan this, Omar throwing a tomato at AOC. Right, what's yeah, going on there? Well, and this is the issue of whether or not these guys can govern and why the only thing they can possibly accomplish is blocking McCarthy. There's no other way and there's no world in which we live where they coalesce a majority of the conference behind their desire for uh, fresh leadership. All they can do is claim a scalp. Because and they can't the claim a scalp. The, conference wants, the broad majority of the conference wants to govern. And if McCarthy can't collect the votes, they're going to turn to somebody else who wants to govern, not somebody that is going to get their seal of approval. Yeah, you know, David, I actually think the OK button is one of the shrewd, the only Kevin button, the OK button. And the OK caucus has a majority of the House. So there isn't going to be an alternative speaker. There might not be an assembly of the House for a long time. This might become a, That's why I, I tell everyone, if you're mad at the omnibus, blame Matt Gates. Because they would not, they might have punted the omnibus into next year if there had been a House majority guarantee, but they could not run the risk of the government shutting down. And I've been defending the conservatives who voted for it. You cannot have the defense industry, you can't have the Department of Defense running on a CR. You just can't. No, no. And I mean, look, that, that's certainly um, a viable explanation. You, you have Republican senators looking at their inability to unify, knowing the past history of larger majorities to govern. And they're saying to themselves, we're going to give you 
a mandate that the voters didn't give you to do something you couldn't even do when you had a mandate. Now, granted, this goes back some years, but it's the same sort of behavior. And there's just no confidence that they can get it done. When you can't agree to organize and live with the majority you have and at least get things started, uh, that's why you have a lot of Senate Republicans, at least, you know, almost half of them, say, we're not going to do this. And look, secretly, I'm sure lots of House Republicans are very happy about what Senate Republicans did. Of I know course they are. Different opinion. Of I course understand they all of that. But you need to be able to move the ball down the field, not constantly throw Hail Marys that have no chance of getting caught and getting into the end zone. Yeah, if the knucklehead caucus actually screw up for any period of time, even one day, I would think, they're all going to get primary, and they're all going to get tossed out, and they're going to be done. Because they are... More than George Santos, they are a menace to the rest of us. George Santos is a diversion, and we'll see how he does in his two years of rehab. Uh, political rehab is beginning for George Santos next week. We'll see how that goes. David M. Drucker, you have a happy new year. I hope you get to spend it in California, as I will. Don't go anywhere, America. Hour number two of this Tuesday edition, December the 27th. Good glory, America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt. In 2022, one person had the greatest luck of everyone else in America and the worst luck of everyone else in America. That person would be George Santos. For 51 weeks, he had the greatest luck in America. And then in the week where there is no news, George Santos has been discovered to have padded his resume, and that's being generous. Byron York joins me to discuss the strange case of of how a city with four or five newspapers, we got the Daily News, the Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, there's got to be another one in there somewhere, the Village Voice, if it's still alive. How did they miss this, Byron? I don't know, and uh, you left out the Democratic Party. I, mean, yes. I, I have to say, after this story broke in the New York Times, there were a lot of Democrats, I mean, they expected to win this seat, you know, well before the, the campaign, they thought this was a seat we are going to keep, and... Um, they, after the New York Times story breaks, they think, holy moly, we, how, how did we miss this? Is there something called Oppo Research or <laughs> Wikipedia or something? And it was, I mean, it's just absolutely astonishing that they missed it. Well, dead people have been elected before, and dead men walking have now been elected. I don't know. Maybe George Santos becomes the greatest congressman ever, and they, he will be seated. The Republicans are not throwing away one of their 10-seat majority, right? <laughs> They have, I mean, uh, basically, they have a five-seat majority, right? I mean, right, you, ten you seats. Lose, you lose five, and they lose the majority. So they have right. basically kind of four. So this is, George Santos is twenty-five percent of the Republican majority. Yes, and that is, you know, you're right to point that out. That is the context that this is happening in. That's why it makes it so difficult for Republicans. If Republicans had a twenty-two-seat majority right now. What do you think the attitude towards Santos? Well, you know, I don't know, because turnabout is fair play. And I'm quite certain that if a Democrat were in this position, Nancy Pelosi would say something nice about him, or a Hakeem Jeffries. But yeah. it, he isn't. And George Santos didn't go in anywhere. But at least it's given us something to chew on, which is, do they not have reporters at the New York Times? Do they not even do a basic look at the Daily News or the New York Post at the resume? Because resumes, we had in Orange County, when I lived in Orange County, we had a supervisor who's now gone to be to her reward, so I'm not going to mention the name, who had many, many fake things on her resume. And yeah. she continued to be a supervisor for another, I don't know, eight years. I think it's particularly egregious because uh, he largely self-financed his campaign. He came up with a good deal of money, over $700,000, to finance his campaign. And you always, I mean, we have a... When you have a self-financed candidate or a candidate who gives a lot to his campaign, the first question is, well, how do you get the money? And um, usually, usually that's open. Like, Daryl Issa is one of the richest men in Congress, right? He's a if very not the richest, yeah. yeah. Very not the successful richest. businessman with car, in the car security business. So you know how he made his money. It's, it's not a question. It was a business he succeeded and George Santos, where did he get the money? I don't well, know. By, Byron, here's my, my view. He ought to call HBO or Netflix and said, I think I got a series, <laughs> being George Santos. 
And being George Santos, episode one is the campaign. Episode two is the reveal about where he got his money. And then episode three is how he goes through the next two years. And episode four will be how he reelects. Uh, because he, you know, it, 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 it will happen. It will happen Good. because it's a, it's a, being George Santos is, I think, a series. What do you think? <laughs> and and the, the buffoons who could be uh, p- portrayed in the press as missing all this. Exactly. Movie. Really, and I mean, I'm serious. Now, do you think he's going to actually stay in Congress? Yes, I for do. an entire term. Yes, I do. And I, unless there's criminality involved in his money, if there's criminality, he may do a. Why well, just go get that money? I mean, if 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 you're not if you you're, you're if you don't already have the money, and you're somebody like millions and millions of Americans who's living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, you can't say, well, just go out and get $750,000. Byron, let me write that. this down. He's going to be the first candidate we discover who has actually been financed by Sam Bankman Freed. Because this has got to <laughs> get bigger. And so I just think I would like to, part three of uh, Being George Santos, my new HBO series, is going to be a conversation with, it's sort of like a, um, a best in show documentary, a mockumentary or Spinal Tap or was yeah. the one a mighty wind you go and you talk to all of the journalists who interviewed George that someone must have covered him at some point right yeah well so, it, it's a congressional district has what 750,000 people roughly there yeah. there are press around there yes he did campaign events he went to the the Republican Women's Confederated wherever they are and I never heard of him until this week had you had you ever heard of a backbencher from the district we weren't supposed to win no, I actually had had not heard of that. Except, I mean, except he's, he's one of those uh, Republicans who had had uh, hurt Democrats in New York and in the seats that they they weren't supposed to win that accounted for this incredibly slim and possibly slimmer majority. Even on election night, as the results came in, I never heard George. Sand- I went to Wyoming to interview first time congressional candidates, people like Juan Siskamani and others, uh, Derek Van Orden. And I met a you know a whole bevy of them and had great interviews. He wasn't there. I don't think Team McCarthy had him on their bingo card. So he shows up and co- it's just kind of hilarious. It's just actually kind of hilarious. And no, and the Democrats demanding he resign. How about that, Byron? What do you think about that? Well, the problem is um, for any party to get up on its uh, moral high horse here. I mean, the Democrats have a prominent a prominent senator who claimed to be. Uh, a Native American, you know, to get a job. And uh, and they got another it, prominent senator who said he's a combat veteran of Vietnam. Yeah, and especially as far as Senator Warren is concerned, people kind of laugh about that. Um, but it, it really was a deception. It really was to get a job. And she's really still in the U.S. Senate after having run for president. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of Republicans are going to say, listen, we don't need your thoughts uh, about this. On the other hand, on the other hand, um, Santos, Santos is, he, he just started talking to the press yesterday, um, and he is by no means answered all the questions, and still the money part comes up. And when you, 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 you quickly dismissed it as saying, as long as there's no criminality there, well, we'll have to see how he got the money. Yeah, you know, Byron, I would put my arms around this if I were him. I, I did a, a show with Al Sharpton once on the Saturday after he had misspelled respect. Do you remember that? R E S P E T. Yes. And remember, Al was just, he looked at me, and I've known Al Sharpton in a long time. I probably 25 years yeah, I did my first interview with him. And I know some people in this audience hate him, but I know, he, I know his past. And I, he said, What do I do? I said, Put your arms around it, man. Spell it R E S P E T every time you do it. Just own it. And so being George Santos is the only way out of this for George Santos, right? Uh, and uh, you, you well, sit but, down and you laugh at the New York Times. You get a reporter in, or you do a live TV with 60 Minutes and you just laugh at the media. I, th- I was running a joke campaign. I thought you guys would figure it out. You make a, I mean, you make a joke about Al Sharpton misspelling a word, but Al Sharpton had a very serious history yes. of um, incendiary racial remarks. Maybe leading to violence and and death, yes. Exactly, exactly. And you look at that and you say, my goodness, what what does it take to sort of disqualify you from the public conversation? Oh, every Democrat is yelling Donald Trump right now at you, Byron. Every Democrat in the world. (laughs) Unlike Al Sharpton, uh, Donald Trump actually got elected president once, uh, and that changed everything. But in terms of Sharpton, who has been on MSNBC forever now, 
has his own program, has had it for a, a, a long time. There was, there was just no repercussions as far as that's concerned. I no. think, you know, the, the problem is George Santos doesn't have a congregation. Uh, he doesn't have that base of national support that Al Sharpton had. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if he has the media gifts. Uh, Byron, that the Kardashians does. showed the way. The Kardashians showed the way. This is a reality TV series. Look, I think and, obviously this is this is a great idea, and you should pitch this. I mean, you should go to George Santos and said, "Sign up I'm not for me." Getting, I'm not getting half. near George. The first thing I'll I checked was, the, and let's go to Netflix. It worked for Harry and Meghan. Come on, let's do it. <laughs> you know, I I looked. I checked the guest log. Because, you know, I never know who I've interviewed if, if I do a one-off on a congressional candidate. And I had not interviewed George Santos, and I was extremely relieved that I did not <laughs> interview George Santos. <laughs> because, look, if you're listening right now, George, call your agent. If you haven't got an agent, call up uh, Javelin or anybody else. I mean, Keith, it is a series. I mean, Byron, it is a series, right? You just follow him around. And will you think people will sit next to him willingly at the caucus? Somebody's got to, right? I mean, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's not that crowded in the Republican it's Caucus. Not, I mean, it's just I think over should, the line. He should announce he's joining the Freedom Caucus today. Or, or you know, actually, let me quickly. Any any updates on your side about Kevin McCarthy? The OK Caucus will prevail, but any update? No, I think it's amazing how static all of this has been. The five, the people you call the Knucklehead Caucus, yes. have held firm so far, but they were always going to hold firm through this point, at least. Well, we are into the thank, thank God for George Santos. So no one would have anything to talk about. The New York Times, by the way, is covering him like Chernobyl right now because that's all they've got to do in the week between Christmas and New Year's. Byron York, have a very happy New Year. I'll be right back, America. George Santos, if you're out there, you can call me at 1 800 520 1234 and we can start being George Santos right now. Stay tuned. Senator, where are you today? Good morning. Good morning, Hugh. It's uh, good to talk to you. I'm still sitting around the tree, which we'll be leaving up for a while longer. Uh, nice to have uh, Christmas around the house for a few more days. In fact, I believe in the 12 days of Christmas, you should leave everything up until January 6th. Well, I, I don't think we have that problem because we're skedaddling from the Beltway, and so everything will come down today. Senator, I got a note over the weekend from a very loyal listener who said, would you please ask Senator Cotton why he voted for this uh, horrible omnibus? And I explained to him, in my view, I would have voted for it because I need the national security money and the House might not be working for a couple of months. Why did you? Hugh, that's basically right. Uh, I understand uh, your listeners' point of view. There's certainly a lot to dislike in the bill, um, but it does secure a sizable and badly needed increase in defense spending without an equivalent increase in domestic spending. And that's at a time that China is rapidly arming up and our troops, uh, in many cases, are struggling mightily uh, without a pay raise. Um, the bill also includes a few other smaller priorities like higher sentences for fentanyl traffickers, uh, the ban on TikTok on U.S. government devices. I got my amendment in at the last minute um, that adds the 9-11 families and the Beirut Marine Barracks bombing families to the terror victim fund. Um, so those were good small wins in it. There's a lot to dislike in the bill, though, but I believe under the circumstances, it was the best practical outcome we were going to get, especially for our military um, after the new year. Uh, while we're going to have a new Republican House, you're also going to have Democrats in charge of the Senate still, and I suspect they would have demanded a ransom in the form of tens of billions of higher, tens of billions of dollars in higher domestic spending than this bill contained. Uh, probably uh, not acceptable to a Republican House. So in the end, what you might have had is a months-long or even years-long stalemate with a series of stopgap funding measures that wouldn't have only lost the sizable increase we gained in defense spending, but also would have frozen defense spending and defense programs where they were last year. And I just think that's a, a dangerous and risky proposition, given the threat we face from China. Now, all, all that said to you, again, I, I agree with your listener that a lot of bad stuff in the bill, and also the process is not good. So what we want to do in the new Congress, and we want to do it early, you know, we want to do it in the spring, we want, don't want to do it in the third week of December, is find the time to kind of put our foot down and demand that Chuck Schumer uh, do what I expect the House will do, which is bring up uh, the annual spending bills in an orderly fashion that allows them to be debated and amended and voted on separately. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of Senate Republicans, whether they voted for or against the bill or committed that, 
we just have to maintain that focus in the spring. Yeah, Senator Cotton, Ken Calvert will be the chairman of the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee in the House. He'll be the chairman. They'll pass a responsible appropriation when the NDAA gets done in 2023. It will finally have at least a House version that fully funds it. Do you think there is a possibility, given the ominous nature of the war in Ukraine and of China's continued acceleration of armament, that you might actually get an NDAA and a defense appropriations bill through before summer? I mean, that would be a rational thing to do. I, I hope so, Hugh. Again, this goes back to the failures of Democratic leaders during my time in the Senate, first Harry Reid and since Chuck Schumer, uh, to bring forward the defense authorization bill and the defense spending bill in a responsible, timely fashion. We haven't gotten to this position uh, because of a failure across the board of members of Congress to prioritize these fundamental tasks of government. Uh, it's because Chuck Schumer and Harry Reid and then the Democrats who march in lockstep with them thinks it's to their advantage to wait until the very last week of the year to pass both of those bills. And again, this is what I mean when I say we, we need to find a time to put our foot down early when Schumer has his priorities and we say that unless we start addressing the nation's priorities as well, we simply aren't going to give you the uh, votes you need to move forward in the Senate on your business. Um, I, I don't know exactly when that moment will be. It'll take 41 Republicans and hopefully 49 Republicans aligning and staying in agreement and holding firm on something early in the year to try to force uh, Schumer to have something like a uh, regular and orderly process. Um, I do think the House is going to do those things, and that'll put, that should put pressure on uh, Chuck Schumer and the Senate Democrats as well. Now, I'm holding Only the Strong, which is Senator Cotton's new book. If you got a gift card for Christmas, you want to go get Only the Strong and get smart about national defense. Only the Strong, uh, a bestseller when it first came out, still selling strong. Senator Cotton, I want to ask you about uh, what Admiral Mark Montgomery, retired, said to me on uh, the last broadcast day before Christmas when the Admiral was on, that the Taiwan measures in the bill are the, first, the most substantive since the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979. Do you agree with that assessment? There are a lot of very good measures, and not quite as much as I would have liked, but a lot of very good measures. You, you saw China once again sending dozens of uh, air, military aircraft in, around, in and around Taiwan's airspace just in recent days. It's a reminder of how important it is that we help Taiwan arm up and do so rapidly. Now, one of the things the Admiral told me is we don't even have the submarine production capacity in the United States to help the AUKUS countries, Australia in specifically, build their nuclear submarine force. Is that correct in your view? Yeah, Hugh, our, our uh, shipbuilding capacity to include submarine building capacity has fallen behind where it once was and where it needs to be. That's a kind of a, a story across our defense industry, still a leader in the world, but can't do things like uh, can't produce things like basic munitions at a rapid enough rate uh, just for the war in Ukraine alone. So imagine what it would be like if we faced a war with China over Taiwan, uh, or imagine how Ta China perceives our ability to deter China from going for the jugular in Taiwan, given the challenges we're seeing in our defense uh, industry right now. Now, Senator, I want to turn to Ukraine. Uh, I don't know if you made it to the Zelensky speech or not. Were you able to get there? Yes, I did. I always try to attend a speech of any foreign leader who speaks to our Congress. So what was your reaction to uh, President Zelensky's message? I thought the speech was well put. He expressed his gratitude to the American people uh, for their generous support for his military thus far uh, and reiterated that he's not asking for American troops to fight Ukraine's war for them. He's simply asking for the military support that his own troops need to fight that war. As he put it, Ukrainian soldiers are more than capable of driving American tanks and flying American aircraft. <laughs> I think that was a, a subtle point to uh, President Biden, who continues, in my opinion, to uh, be uh, too frightful of providing more advanced weaponry to Ukraine, even though we now have a nearly year-long pattern of President Biden denying certain kinds of weapons, like anti-aircraft missiles or high Mars rocket systems or now Patriot missile defense systems that are then provided three or four months later, uh, when if they had been provided in a timely fashion, uh, you might not have seen the invasion occur in the first place, or you might not have seen Russia take so much territory that Ukraine then has to fight to retake. Senator, are you worried about, you know, I am not worried about Ukraine invading Russia. I know that they sent a drone in to hit an Air Force base over the weekend. I know there's an occasional reciprocal attack, but I don't think there's anyone that doubts that Russia is engaged in systemic 
war crimes, that they are using missiles against innocent civilians and intentionally targeting civilians. Moreover, there are massacres in places like Bucha. Is there any doubt in your mind that Ronald Reagan would have advanced weaponry to Ukraine on the scale that we are doing so? No question whatsoever, Hugh. I think you can see uh, from what happened in <clears throat> Afghanistan, uh, which was a largely covert operation conducted through our intelligence agencies, that he did not have qualms uh, about arming um, partners and allies, especially the enemies of our enemies all around the world. Uh, the Ukrainian people uh, are not aggressors here. Um, They're not guilty. Uh, Russia launched a war of invasion uh, against Ukraine in February, and now Russia, as you say, is killing women and children and trying to make civilian population suffer. Um, I, I think we should support those people in their efforts to fight back and defend their own territory, which, as Winston Churchill said early in the history of the British-speaking peoples, is the primordial right of any people to die and to fight and kill for its own land. So, Senator, I want to finish up on this. Within the Republican Party, as within the Democratic Party, there are voices that oppose additional aid to Ukraine. Some of the arguments they use are just flat-out lies, that Zelensky is a crook and things like that. Others are, we are simply overextended, we need to take care of Americans at home. Does the conference ever debate this in closed session among yourselves sitting around a table? And if so, what is the argument against aiding Ukraine? This is like the easiest argument to make in the world because it's Russia. They are the enemy of NATO. They are the ally of China and Iran. We do not want them strong. We want them weak. And we cannot allow a sovereign nation to be trampled, especially when we guaranteed their frontiers in 1994. So, yeah, I think for a lot of people, there's a frustration uh, about Biden administration's many failures. Uh, you know, one thing you hear uh, from time to time is that Joe Biden appears to care more about Ukraine's borders than he cares about America's borders. Um, I think that's something of a non sequitur, though. We as Republicans can care about our borders first, and we can also care about the borders of our friends, especially friends who have had their borders invaded uh, by a war of aggression against them, by an enemy like Russia. Um, also, there's concern about inflation, uh, which I understand. Um, a lot of this money, though, um, is being spent on our own defense industry. It's being spent for our own soldiers who have been forward deployed to eastern NATO countries. Um, I think that's needful spending. I also don't think it has the same kind of inflationary impact that, say, the Democrats' $2 trillion uh, blowout stimulus bill uh, had early last spring, which launched a lot of this inflation. Those are two of the main concerns. Again, I think what we're getting in Ukraine right now in terms of, of standing up um, for a world that is led by the United States, uh, that respects the rights of peoples to be secure in their own lands, uh, that doesn't allow aggressive dictators like Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping or the Ayatollahs in Iran to redraw the map uh, at their own whims um, is actually a pretty good bargain uh, for what we're spending there. Um, we're not putting our own troops in harm's way. We're not putting uh, or we're not ri risking the lives of Americans. And the Ukrainians have shown not only are they willing to fight over the last 10 months, but they're more than capable of fighting and doing so successfully. Last question, Senator. It's been almost three years since you were the first public official, elected official, to come on the air and talk about the Wuhan virus and to worry that we needed to close air travel. China is reopening air travel to the world, even as it's becoming a giant Petri dish for mutations of the COVID virus. Any concerns there? Yeah, I do have concerns, Hugh. Um, you know, China has gone from a failed zero COVID policy to what I suspect is a failing let it rip policy. Um, they are still in many ways where we were in March of 2020, um, ill-prepared for a large surge in COVID cases going into their hospitals, um, and, and also, uh, in a way, worse because of so many different variants now. Uh, one just hopes that uh, this new let-it-rip policy does not create even worse kind of variants um, that would then, of course, be unleashed to the world. I suspect that, or I would say the Biden administration needs to be at least evaluating options uh, for further travel restrictions from China. Um, given those circumstances, but uh, considering the fact that they labeled me and Donald Trump and others as xenophobic and racist and nativist when we proposed the first travel ban from China in January 2020, I suspect the Biden administration is not taking those steps. Well, Senator Cotton, I hope you were wrong about that, but you were right in 2020, and you were the first to be right publicly, so I applaud you for, for exercising that caution. Have a great new year, a great start to 2023. We will talk to you in the new year. Senator Tom Cotton, always a pleasure. Thank you, Hugh. Merry Christmas or Happy New Year to you and all your listeners. Thank you.